Hi, welcome Akshit Arora yeah. for this podcast. This is a kind of a podcast where I was always waiting to do. You know, I think he's the first guest as a solution architect and the first guest from Nvidia. You know, basically what we are going to cover is not his role as a solution architect completely, but we are going to just touch upon those points which you are supposed to be doing when you are just a computer science enthusiast. trust me there is no person other than akshit arora who took lot of lot and lot of pre calls before the podcast recording in order to just set the questions for you folks i think just make sure that you guys completely understand the scenario of what industry is and what academy is because academy is a whole new level of approach because it's something different from industry so Here we are with Akshit Arora demystifying what is the actual thrill of working in both in academia as well as in industry. Thank you so much, sir. So thanks for uh, the kind introduction, which was it's, uh, great to be here. I've seen some of your podcasts before, so uh, it it's an honor to be actually talking to you now. So thanks for having me. Yes, it's my pleasure having you as a guest on my podcast. So let me just start with the toughest question. what's the actual computer science hustle that we need to put in like i'm asking you in terms of the first language that we need to learn the first approach that we need to follow and probably some algorithms anything like that you want to really convey the right approach to hustle in the computer field what's that you know you should really know binary search <laughs> no i i wish it was as simple as that so uh, i think it it depends on where you are coming from and what you are trying to do uh, because certainly right uh, not everyone starts computer science to become a software engineer there are many researchers coming in from like you know machine learning and ai is is an interest of many fields so you will see people from psychology you will see people from physics you will see people from all all over the world who are um, now looking into programming because there are some of the tools that are built for them and they would like to use them as efficiently as possible now if you are one of those people who uh, whose end goal is not to become a software engineer and and just to like do some rapid prototyping then start with python because that's the easiest thing out there at least in ai with lots and lots of frameworks providing support for python like first hand it's important uh, to learn that first and then this just get started as soon as possible right you're trying to illustrate something to the world i think python is a great way to do that but then coming it from a different perspective uh let's say your end goal is uh to try and optimize the performance of a certain algorithm on a certain system now you will need to go deeper in that right and and that this is something for those people who are uh, starting out as like let's say bachelors in computer science and your end goal is to make be a software engineer and you need to optimize uh like algorithms everywhere and and optimize for performance how do you do that all of these frameworks if you look at them if you look at their architectures deep down they are like they have a c api so if you want to customize the software to the maximum level like that's where you can go you can go even deeper but i think c is the basic language where uh, a software engineer can start thinking about interacting with with the hardware uh, in a way that that makes a lot more sense so C C++ definitely good for understanding how things work how things can be optimized uh definitely gets you thinking about that it will help you understand the basics of each and every software like even if you go open source you will be able to easily able to understand okay how does tensorflow work or how does pytorch work right and and that's something important to understand when you're trying to productionize tensorflow in product, like if you're trying to serve a recommendation algorithm let's say right you want to maximize the performance how do you do that uh and you do that when you go down to that level and you look at how things are working and then you try to find optimizations you just don't do that at python level because apis don't exist out there right so that that would be my approach to depends you know where you're coming from uh, just feel free to take the approach that you like yeah no do you remember the pre podcast call that we had i was supposed to be proving that i am interviewing somebody who is from a computer science but that gene of hardware 
never left me off <laughs> like an, yeah. i was an easy grad so i was actually an easy grad there like yeah. there is a there is a lot of difference between anything and everything that you are doing like you can be working on docker itself but there is huge amount of approaches that differ like docker compose docker volume things like that no like you are yeah. in nvidia now for for a good amount of time like it's a good amount of time to understand any institution because mm-hmm. nvidia is a public company now so it's not it's not just belonging to jensen huang or any person but it's an institution now which is like everybody needs it now so i want to know something about nvidia very close by like what's the role of nvidia in deep learning market today like we have seen memes which say a cow which is in deep learning but nvidia comes with a lot of cantons saying to draw something more out of the same cow like there are a lot of memes which has actually caught our mind like what's the role of nvidia in deep learning market today i think the one thing important to understand is where like and why nvidia is here at all in the first place right uh, i'm not sure about the memes you're talking about i'm not too much into social media like that but if if they're there and you say them they're there sure i trust you so i haven't seen them personally so i don't think i'll be able to relate to them uh now just let's talk about like why is nvidia here right uh, and and you you're probably already aware about most of the stuff but to recap for, for even for the audience right so we started out as a graphic like company right like everybody knows nvidia by gaming right so in gaming what is the most common compute compute that you have to do you have to compute the next frame and deliver it to whatever display you're using as soon as possible and as fast as possible right you do that by doing mul- matrix multiplications really 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 fast now come in in 2012 if you remember there, there was this huge challenge called uh um, you know uh, ILS VRC which is basically about recognizing objects in the imagenet data set right and in 2012 the the entity that came in it was called alexnet and it essentially half the error rate from like a year ago it jumped the accuracy by 10 percentage point and that's like a huge huge gap that's a huge improvement right there that's where industry started to think about hey we thought these problems were unsolvable before right uh, if you're thinking about let's say autonomous robots in a in a warehouse that that didn't used to happen before or if it was it was like really really constrained and really controlled manner you you had to have a human there but then slowly these algorithms and, and especially with deep learning in 2012 that pattern started to change and people started to trust machine learning a little bit more right and they needed a hardware where they could run it as soon as possible and then serve it back to the users right you want to train your new robot as soon as possible and and put it into production or even even now let's say uh facebook right if you think about the trends or even twitter or any social media company right if there is a viral trend like memes you talked about if there is a viral trend you need to be able to recognize that oh this is like everyone who is seeing this is liking it it must be popular let me show it to even more users let me show that to even more users who figures that out there is no human sitting there right right there is some kind of neural network which is doing uh, it doesn't have to be a neural network it could be some other class of algorithms but it's looking at the users identifying patterns and returning in real time what it thinks is the best thing for user engagement right to to be able to do that you need to be able to train this model in real time and and serve it back to the users and you need to be able to do that quickly you can't be like hey this pattern came in like 24 hours ago we noticed it and now 24 hours after i'm serving it to the rest of the users you can't afford that today because people want the content now they don't want it 24 hours later right like everybody wants it now if it's viral we should know about it that's the user's perspective so that's where you know gpus come in we the, they help in train and they help in doing the inference in real time and as fast as possible for for the world so that that that's how i see nvidia's role in deep learning today yeah yeah you know that's a very very short introduction to what deep learning market is and what <laughs> nvidia share in market is because you know when i read the alex katausian's alexnet paper you know it was something which was phenomenal i think during that time there was an uh, 
computer vision challenge for the computers to understand if if i give an mri scan to a neural network it has to first analyze it it's a scan from a brain you know today when you see the advancement in the technology technology doesn't have that requirement at all because everything is boom 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 fast and like it's available to us like in the form of cloud cluster in a form of any any form factor i think probably i can code something in my mobile app and i can run it on my laptop today so this is how yeah. advanced technology is like but like speaking of the roles right you know we all have our dreams you know i wanted to be a dft engineer but changed myself back to the software field itself like dft was in vlsi but like mm-hmm. i really want to really work on deep learning now because i was working on computer vision things and things which were really close to hardware but use software extensively over the course of time like there is a huge gap between the dreams that we are dreaming today and the roles that we get in india okay. that's for sure like what's the actual <laughs> role of a solution architect because most of the time when i see other solution architects i get confused like okay they might be working on some cool hardware architecture or something very very niche to the technology that we might be working on because they might be working on something advanced like just clear off that what's that thing that a solution architect does you know of course there are a lot of them but you can clarify them for sure okay so this the way solutions architect works at nvidia is slightly different from the way typically solutions architect is defined over all the industry and i would also go to the liberty and say there are very few organizations that have solutions architect in the first place so let's think of it uh, from a broader perspective right uh, if i were to use one line and explain my role that that will be my job here is to make sure it's easy for the developers to train and do inference from their models like as soon as possible in an as performant like the most performant way from gpu that's like that's one line okay the developers can be anywhere it could be nvidia's partners it could be even outside like people trying out new things on their own uh and and there are many ways that we connect with them right uh so it's kind of you can think of a consulting role where you go in and and you help you identify what the bottlenecks are in their system right they give you access to their code they give you access to their data uh and and the whole entire system and how how it's built and then you recognize hey in this part of the pipeline you have this major io bottleneck or or compute bottleneck let's let's do something about it and and let's use maybe some kind of nvidia sdk or even a non nvidia sdk to solve that problem so that the entire pipeline becomes a little bit more efficient and then we do these iterations over and over again until they are able to achieve the, whatever targets they are trying to achieve right whatever they are optimizing for so uh that that's what my job is now in this way it also helps our products to improve because there are certain the gaps in our products as well we get a uh, feedback and 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 we improve that and we do that for the rest of the world now th- that's how the whole community sort of improves itself it's it's all there is always a feedback loop we act as that feedback loop for nvidia right uh so yeah, that that how i would describe solutions architect role it's about uh optimizing and then whatever you learn from that you give it to the rest of the world and and, and so they have their own iteration and then the things start improving from then on uh most of the things if i were to draw a parallel you would see in gcp or google cloud platform right in aws amazon web services you, they will have their own solutions architect as well and they do the exact same thing they help like you know enterprises go from whatever data centers they are using on to aws or on to gcp depend on uh, what they are doing and also they look at like what is the best way to optimize that pipeline right certainly as you said right you could code something on your phone and run it on your laptop and uh, you could access cloud very easily today uh, and that's the the future is cloud computing for sure right now th- that's where those architects sort of help onboard new and new people or uh, onto those platforms and and help optimize right as in a similar way like we partner with aws so we are also part of that team 
where we go in as people who can optimize things on GPUs and AWS has a lot of GPUs, GCP has a lot of GPUs, right? So it helps the entire community that way. Um, yeah. Okay, no, but what's your journey as a deep learning researcher, as a student and as a professional, you know, because today when we see, you also said that, you know, NVIDIA gives its own tensor flows. NVIDIA has its own Dockerized containers, which comes out, which is optimized on systems. Like you can just download it, run it on it. It's platform independent and things like that. And when I mm -hmm. see, sometimes when I see Azure as one such platform, it's still using the NVIDIA GPUs. <laughs> we can't deny the fact that NVIDIA is in every place that yeah. whether you are in AWS, GCP, Azure, you still need to work on an NVIDIA GPU to some extent. And I love the NVIDIA SMI commands on Google Cola because as soon as I yeah. restart my session, there will be some new GPU which will be allocated for me. Like I still right. love that, but like as a researcher, right? You know, we, I myself took a lot of time to explore some new algorithms. I myself took a lot of time to start reading research papers because it's different from what you really think. You might dream of building a complete AI based Jarvis or something. But reality is like you will not even build 10% of the Java's because building a neural network architecture is something different here. So oh, by the way, that problem is already solved. We, yeah, we already solved. have a Java's. Yeah, we already have a Java's, but like not from a person, but it's from <laughs> an entire community right there, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, okay. let's just speak of the reality of being a researcher, both as a student, both as a professional in the field of deep learning. I, I can talk about my journey here. And talk about your you, it's, it's mostly, you know, back and forth between um, software engineering and research. And, and I think that's how it, it is for, for a lot of people. Uh, when you do realize that uh, research has great things, but then it doesn't get you the kind of deployment that you're seeking for whatever you're trying to do. And then sometimes engineering is just engineering and it doesn't involve any novelty, right? So I sort of have switched back and forth. So during my undergrad, it was like, we, when we started, like we started with, you know, C++, that's it. And then web development and then very basic and fundamental concepts and the, and the every person, like even around me wanted to become a software engineer. Most of them did become a software engineer. But by the time I uh, sort of came to my, you know, final year, I realized that there is a whole new world out there with, uh, where there is research. And the way I did that was I had this internship in, um, where I got to experiment with cognitive science. It, you, there is no relation to machine learning, at least in the scope of my project. But I got to see, okay, what is, what is experimental methodology? What is statistics? How does that apply? And, and how do you publish a paper? And what is the kind of research community out there? At that point of time, I also got the opportunity to come, like fly to US and, and fly to like uh, Orlando and, and give a presentation. And that's where I saw, hey, there are like so many people doing very similar things and solving these incredibly challenging problems around the world. Um, it, it was a conference. Naturally, that's where I was giving a presentation. So that was very inspiring for me. And that's the point where I decided I need to do research. Like that is the novelty in my life. I can't do like a coding job for, for even like in the near future. I really didn't want it. So I, along with some other students, we like applied for grad school and we came to grad school. Within grad school, I had this thing clear that I want to do something with psychology, but it has to be also related to computer science because that's where I, a lot of my skill set was, right? So if I were to apply things, even like you could in experiments, right? You need some kind of software prototype. So there is always a requirement of a coder. That was a good thing for me. Now, as I entered CU Boulder, I, I met this professor called uh, Mike Moser, right? And he was actually into deep learning. Uh, I got into, got, got to sit in his first class. I got inspired that, hey, deep learning is that one place where you get to combine lots of different, uh, like it's an interdisciplinary field, right? So you get to combine psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience, it all blends together and suddenly makes sense to me to like, okay, jump right into it. Uh, and when I did that, we published another paper and uh, we got to do an independent study with him. But then along the line, I got this internship with a startup in Boulder. It was an educational technology startup. The task for me was to productize a neural network. 
whatever I had built the previous semester for with the professor. It was also in collaboration with the startup. I wanted to productize it. Like that's a very basic thing, right? How how hard can it be to productize something that is already there, right? Algorithm is known. It should be able to productize. It took three months that I was not able to productize it. <laughs> so turns out there is a whole new ball game about okay, what kind of frameworks, what kind of hardware, how do you serve it? How do you set up the networking? How do you set up the pipeline? There is no democratized way to serve deep learning today. That was the harsh reality that I faced during my you know, three, four months in that startup. And that's where I decided, okay, I am going to pause on research and I'm going to learn how to put whatever I built, whatever new thing I built into production. Because otherwise, I couldn't see the impact of whatever I did, right? And I really wanted to do, I really wanted to see that. And that's when I started, like, completely changed my plans and went on and, and like, I wanted to go into industry. And that is specifically as a data scientist. Otherwise, uh, like, you know, it just wouldn't work for me. I, I just didn't like software engineering as much. Um, based on the people that I talked to, it it just sounded right for me to be either like a research engineer or someone like a um, data scientist. So I applied everywhere, you know, you do the whole interview loops and loops and loops, and then finally got this perfect opportunity and, and very up. I didn't even know about it until I applied for it and I got to talk to people who are already in that job. I, I sent lots and lots of LinkedIn messages and there are, there are a lot of kind people there. Like you get to talk to people and you realize, hey, is this something I want to do? And then you apply, right? That makes a whole lot of difference in your application and then further when you interview. Because at least in America, like the fit has to be there. You have to be a good fit for the job. Uh, and unless that doesn't happen, you just don't get, get it, right? So when we talked about solutions architect it sounded exactly the kind of role i wanted to pursue because it gave me insights into the research as well as insights into how to productize it and that's what i'm doing today i i talked when i talked to like nvidia's partners and nvidia's customers they are like hey this new paper came out last week we want to productize it how do i do that on gpus those are the kind of problem statements that i encounter and my team encounters from a lot of different partners right and then we start working upon, hey, okay, what part of this network can go on GPU? What part of this network can go on CPU? And that's where you maximize throughput and you know minimize your latency and then serve it to the users. How do you do that? Uh, so that's where like I am today. Let, let's see where, where this journey takes me. But uh, I think you'd always look around and feel that, is this something that is inspiring for me and that'll, you know, I wake up to do every day? Is that something I, I really want? And uh, if you ask yourself that question, you automatically know what kind of thing you want to do. If you don't know that, I would recommend start talking to people who are already in that space and that'll help get you some perspective as to where you fit well. Uh, and I think that, that's gonna help you overall in your career as well. So that'll be my, my recommendation uh, as a you know researcher and a student and a professional, yeah. No, that really cleared a lot of doubts that I had, you know, because even in order to prepare as a professional, you need all these things. You need to understand the industry. You need to know the pulse of the market because it can change like this. It can really change very fast. Like a joke can become very popular within a second. A paper can yeah. go viral within a second. Like if it's like a legit one, which has a lot of hard work from big researcher at least, or else from a researcher who is working on something disruptive, yeah, it can really happen. Like, you know, like there are a lot of ways in which industry has seen a lot of changes, but like how to prepare as a professional in this world today? Because it's not about the interviews that I'm asking. It's all about the approaches that we need to give, the right approaches. We said about meeting people, but like how, what, where, why? There are hundreds of different questions which I had when I was, I was, I was not that well versed in LinkedIn when I just joined to bachelors. Like I had my LinkedIn when I, when I just passed out of the 12, because I had a guy called as Anup Sridhar who really told me just get inside LinkedIn, see the people's profile there, just understand what they're doing. Like when I saw some people were, you know, this hundred days, hundred certificates was not there during that time. Okay. 
this 100 days 100 certificates was not there until we saw the lockdown like i saw like close to around 15 profiles like posts which posted like 100 days have completed 100 certificates but during that time i used to see them like two two courses or three courses or course the highest that i saw was 10 courses or courses one specialization today i today i i myself within the course of four years i have done four five specializations yeah including one on neuro imaging deep learning and things like that right no like oh, it's okay. very very different today because it's not about certificates also today like it's way more different like i want these points to be noted from a professional like you so yeah you can give as much as points that people can really think about and jot down and say that hey i need to do this i need to do that it's all about what you said now i think my only thought there would be like don't think of it as it's like a bucket list right it it's really not that i i know people like the thing that is one size that fits all it does it it doesn't it you have to be uh passionate about it and you probably already are if you're thinking about doing all these things you probably already are if you're listening to us right now let's take the next step what is the thing that you're curious about right now at this moment within deep learning if that's something you want to pursue what is the one thing that you are very curious about i am i will tell you what i was curious about when i when i started like my sop for my grad school actually read that i wanted to study uh, you have like i i'm into photography right and i'm also into music like very clearly <laughs> so uh, from photography perspective the thing that i was curious about the most was hey uh, if i am taking the photo of a scene anything like let's say let's say uh, you're taking the photo of my airpods right now what is like there are millions of perspectives like from here from here from here i can take its photo right like there are millions of points through which i can take its photo it's going to look very different which one is the best which one is going to be the one that uh you love the most how do you how do you recognize that uh and that was that was something that i wanted to study as i started in deep learning and obviously that this is something of, of more of a you know computer vision domain like you know what is the object how do you recognize that and then how do you think about and simulate all the different perspectives where you can uh, click the photograph it's also something that is applicable in a conversational ai domain like let's say you and i are talking about career there are lots and lots of perspectives to think when you talk about career which is the one perspective that will uh, help you get the knowledge that you are seeking and help me communicate that to you which is that one perspective uh in music there is not now if you look at experiments.google.com you will find like ai is jamming with the keyboard right uh, isn't that like You've surprising met. isn't that yeah exactly uh, so isn't that surprising isn't that something that piques your curiosity and i think you should follow that you should follow that and see where that takes you and then align that curiosity with whatever it is that you are pursuing right now maybe you are doing a specialization maybe you are in bachelor's maybe you are in masters but then try to align those two things as much as you can find that alignment i'll tell you you will get motivated every day to do it and that's where great things start to happen i have seen people building open source projects out of just their curiosity they don't care how many stars or folks it gets they just care about hey did it solve something for me or not did it did it help satisfy my curiosity or not and that's about it that's really all you need once you do that and once you show it to other people once you share that with the world once you announce it to the world on you know, linkedin or if you go to a meetup let's say i i used to attend a python meetup here when we could be there in person and um, i would just like show my project there right and get feedback from people and that's where you start improving as as a professional as and as a researcher what are researchers like they're artists right i i think of them as an artist right you're trying to create something new in the world it comes from your imagination and it mostly like there are some data points but then it mostly comes from you uh, as a person or even as someone uh, like even as a team it comes from you right so think think of it from that perspective and get rid of any kind of like bucket list because there is no bucket list uh, a bucket list is for satisfying a certain purpose and i think 
you're building, evolving that purpose over time. So that bucket list is not going to suit you anyway. So that's how my approach has been. And that's how I would like, like it, this is still ongoing, I would say. I am still working on like combining music with AI and uh, combining my love for photography. And I recently, let's say, figured out there was an open source project that lets you, I have four terabytes of photos from all my trips right now in a network attached storage at home. And I am figuring out, hey, how do I apply clustering and figure out where my faces are in those photos or where some, my friend's faces are in those photos. Google Photos does that automatically, but I can't upload four terabytes today, right? Uh, so how do I do that from for my old photos? So still figuring it out, still building that. But hey, if you're listening to this and if you're interested, just hit me up. I have a calendar link where you can reach out to me anytime and, and you know book a slot with me and we can happy to talk about that anytime. So... Yeah, at least I, I've opened the doors for myself. I know a lot of people who have opened these doors. You will find it, find it on their LinkedIn, find it on their Twitter. But people are always open. Like, if you think about it these days, what some people have started doing is there is a crisis in India, right? So what they're asking for is, hey, if you donate to India, you can like book a slot with me and talk about career. Isn't that amazing? Like, you get to talk to a product manager who is so high up in a company. And you get to do that for, like, literally for a good cause why not right it's it's a win-win situation so i think that's something you learn when you start following people that you really admire and you need to figure out who those people are first and i think we all definitely know who who those people are for us uh, i don't think that the, the other way around i think we we do who our idols are right so uh, yeah you know this is the reason why i started this podcast you know i wanted to explore different people you know this yeah. is how which really gave me that sense of appreciation that i'm meeting these great people like any person like it can be dennis rotman who was the first person who wrote a book on transformers or else all very old executives to the very new executives to the people who are from startups you know everybody has different approaches and i think today i'm more blessed and satisfied that i've started this podcast and i had you as my guest Thank you so much, brother. Thank you so much, brother. So, like, it's... Thanks for hosting me. It's, it's a good thing. I think more and more people should start, like, something that, you know, that, that they're interested in. And I, and I see that you are clearly, like, very motivated for this. And your motivations are also right. So, uh, love it. I, I would say, I, I wish I would have done it when I was an undergrad and, and I hadn't, didn't really have the time between research and coding. And I, I, I don't think I, I was... I wanted to talk to people, but it was mostly in one-on-one settings where I, I, I was talking and I uh, didn't interview, but I think no regrets, yeah. I would say. You know, but like, yeah. but like, how have you seen this software engineering as an entire new industry evolve? Because 2002, I don't remember about the dot-com bubble, but 2008, I heard of it again because it was a new disruption because 2008 saw another recession at that point of time and engineers value dropped down to an extent where there's no life in engineering and three years down the line after that probably 2012 2013 i was in class eight class nine class 10 i don't remember like i i passed out in 2015 so class seven i heard the same okay. same person saying that there's a huge demand for engineers today like two years experience 1.5 lakh salary fixed uh-huh lot of things you know i heard yeah. a lot of people i even have heard of people from 1998 pass out engineers and 1990 pass out engineers where in bangalore they in karnataka especially they didn't have an ex- exam for one year like there was supposed to be a one parallel batch which came out like 1989 people passed out in 1990s with the 1990 pass out people like engineering is something which is very 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 different from other other fields like if you are a doctor your life is settled for 30 years that's what my friends say like if you become a doctor 30 years life set like how has this technology as software engineering evolved over the course of time i want your experience which you have experienced over a course of time like meeting with people talking with people so on yeah i that's a very broad question i think uh I would like to like boil it down from my perspective, who was always looking out for, you know, psychology and then data science and then machine learning and deep learning. 
right? Uh, in my point of view, the the first thing that I noticed about like software engineering, my perspective was, hey, it's all about, you know, web development. <laughs> because that's all I knew. At that point of time, that was like this, think of it as first year where you're still exploring, okay, what is this computer science and very naive point of view about what people do in the industry. Uh, of course, the way industry works in India is very hard to explain. And now looking back, I know how to explain it. it it's more of a service industry and it's almost as if there are only a certain group of companies in India today who are doing that innovative learn innovative work at the scale at which like US is. There are plenty of companies who just have India offices and like just for the sake of it for engineering purposes. And then there are uh, there are startups in India who are doing incredible work. Like that is, I can draw parallels to that in San Francisco startups as well. So uh, if my recommendation to my personal self in like uh, 2013 would be, hey, go open a startup in India. If, if you're not pursuing anything else, just go do that because that's the most exciting thing you can do being in India, right? Uh, now, talking about software engineering and how it has evolved, uh, my personal view started from like web, web development and slowly it was about, hey, you can do Node.js and you can do a certain other things, but it was very constructed. I wasn't in touch with lots and lots of software engineers. The way social media portrayed it was it's just nine to five coding. You're sitting there sipping your coffee and just coding, coding, coding nine to five. That was not a lifestyle that I was sort of looking forward to, by the way. Uh, and that's why it was not as inspiring for me. But today when I see software engineering and I have come to really appreciate the work that is being done. It's not just that. It's also about how do you create a modular production system? What are the kind of pipelines? How do you optimize them? And how do you optimize the software at different levels? Right, uh, there is a Python level for optimizing whatever you're doing in TensorFlow, and then there is a C++ level, and then there is a C level, right? Uh, especially when we solve the problem that I mentioned earlier, like how do you uh, in run inference on GPUs in, in the most like amazing manner? There are certain APIs within TensorFlow that don't, don't perform uh, the way we want them to perform. So we sometimes need to write a C++ plugin for that. And that is when they perform in the best way that they can. So that's where I have come to also appreciate my collaboration with software engineers uh, and also seeing myself evolve as a software engineer because this software 2.0, right, which is about data science, which is about uh, putting models into production out there. It's really interesting. It's not the traditional monolithic software anymore. You have to make it modular. You have to make components of it that are running on GPUs that are running on CPUs. And you have to make like various decisions around neural networks, right? Let's say, uh, as I said, right, there is a continuous retraining of models. How do you set that up? In a traditional software, if I was, let's say, deploying, what would you deploy? You would deploy something like a, um, Binary search, for, binary search for that matter. If you were deploying that, or even Elasticsearch, it's a very basic algorithm. Once you deploy it, it just works. Uh, you may have to update certain components of it, but that's about it, right? Uh, it's not a software that is going to evolve over time. But machine learning and deep learning is, is the kind of software that learns over time. You need to be able to look at what it's learning. You need to be able to protect it from bad actors who are trying to feed wrong data into it. And that introduces a whole lot of complications into the traditional software engineering. So that's what I like to call, and, and many people around me like to call software 2.0. Uh, and that's where I think uh, the solutions are going now. It's, I, I, I would even go as far as to say, it's not democratized yet. The traditional software engineering, how it had been in 90s was kind of how it had been before neural networks. Like that's how it, it's been progressing. There are, new languages, new frameworks, but it all isn't about deep learning. Well, since deep learning enters into the situation, it's really hard to make a whole pipeline. It's really hard to productize that. Uh, only a few companies are able to do it and that the ones that were able to do it, only a few of them are able to do it in the most efficient way and get the bang for their buck, right? In the, like, they have to, whatever they're paying for on the cloud, they have to get their money's worth. So this is, uh, something that is, I'm looking forward to. Everyone, like even five years from now, would feel the need of productizing deep learning uh, software if they're not already doing that today. So that, that's something to look forward to. I would say it's exciting rather than like, you know, uh, my 
traditional point of view, which was in first year, like 2013, 2012, that, that nice point of view. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, because, because it's, an, it's a way in which approaches are changing. Like it can be a software firm, but it, it can be solving problems, which is not solvable. Just like how DeepMind just went beyond AlphaGo in order to understand what is intelligence. Of course, it's, it was not a required problem statement, but they did it for understanding what is intelligence. Then AlphaGo. Yeah. Then what? AlphaFold. I was amazed about the ways in which DeepMind was solving problems. Yes, there is a lot. But like they still use the same packages like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Keras, for sure. Because it's all... I always say this in my webinars, it's an API jugad. This deep learning is completely an API jugad. You should know how to play with the API properly, clear with the algorithms. So that's what I give them a quick intro about what it can be. But like, yeah, there is a lot of things behind it. But like, how has the frameworks evolved over the yeah. course of time? And how handy are they in research? And like, how can we actually pull the potentials up about building your frameworks, about using the frameworks also. And when you say framework, I'm going to assume TensorFlow and PyTorch, right? Because anything, anything, anything part. can be. Like so, uh, yeah, okay. So if you think about like evolved frameworks and how they're relevant to the real world, uh, see, it, a software is only as usable as humans want it to be. It's really as simple as that. There are people who are doing incredible things with the same framework and there are people who are not able to see the possibilities out there with that same framework. And that's okay. I think that's where human creativity steps in. And uh, in, in regards to representing the real world problem, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's really as creative as you want it to be. See, as far as, let's say for self-driving cars, how would you design a self-driving car today? You would have to break it down into chunks of tasks and then subtasks all the way until you see that, okay, this is a atomic task. We can't break it down and let's just implement that. And then you start building the whole stack, right? So it's really is how efficient you are at doing and defining your problem. And what is like, you have to scope out your problem. You have to make sure that uh, the, it's not going out of scope in any given scenario. And that's where the boundaries are for these frameworks as well. In regards to how efficient they are in terms of representing real world problems, like it's it's really your creativity that's the limit right now. Uh, I think there are certain more features that we can expect out of these frameworks, but that is depends on our intelligence, right? And that's where I think the most important part is that these frameworks are open source. That's where that helps because now everybody has the ability to contribute to it and you are sort of crowdsourcing uh, what it means to, to, be, uh, to solve a problem, right? And, and I think that's a very important part of it. Everyone should have access to it. And once they do, everyone should understand it. Once they do, new ideas come in and that's where the thing evolves. So that, that's how I see it. It's a continuously evolving thing right you can't take a snapshot and be like hey uh, in terms of efficiency this is this framework is like 80 percent efficient there is no end goal there right what is the 100 percent what does that look like that understanding is also evolving over time so you can't really i, I wouldn't recommend uh designing that kind of metric for a framework uh, it really depends on you it's open source right why don't you change it and do something crazy with it go ahead yeah you know but like what does your typical day look like? Because people might be thinking like, if he is a solution architect, 24 bar seven, he will be in NVIDIA office. Or you told about how creative things are. Like from your side, you still have four terabytes of photos, which are which you are still wondering, how can I apply <laughs> the clustering to it? Like something which is more of an AI and music and things like that. Of course, we all are creative from our side and we make ourselves that time of, separating out the professional life and just going out with that, whatever our mindset says during that time. Like, I really mm -hmm. wanted to ask you this one question, like what does your typical day look like? Like you can start off by saying anything that your day looks like, a day in the life of a solution architect, kind of a thing. 
I think so it's certainly, um, there are many ways to answer this question and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna choose like a purely professional one. Uh, so my role, you set your targets yourself for the most part. It, it's, it's, let me start with that. And then you need to look into, of course there are metrics on which we are evaluated, but at the same time, there is also freedom in the way things are designed for us. Like uh, in, in the day of uh, solutions architect, think of like 40 hour work week, right? You have to be spending like 60% of the time looking at and working on whatever problems you're getting from the community, right? Or your NVIDIA's partners. You have to look at that. Uh, you need to design solutions for that. Could be any solution, but uh, you need to like push it forward basically, right? You need to keep that conversation going. You need to help them with their problem. Once you do that, there is 40% of the time left. In the 20%, you do literally anything you want. Uh, anything creative that you want to implement and 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 in the remaining 20 percent you actually share that with the rest of the team so that they can also share it with you and you kind of build a platform where everyone is doing something interesting and you find collaboration opportunities across teams right uh, it, it's very similar to a lot of other companies that i've seen uh, at least and there is always a 20 percent time concept right like you get to do whatever you want um, with with the tools that are around you and you get to build something creative, you get to share that with the rest of the team. Um, it's a very basic definition of what we do, right? Uh, of course, there is a 60% of the time that I said, okay, we, we talk to customers and we understand their problems and we solve those problems. That entails a lot of different things. You could be talking to engineering, you could be talking to research departments, you could be coordinating between multiple people and uh, you could be also coding in that time depends on what the solution is and what the kind of engagement is at that point of time. So a typical day would be similarly segregated. If you if you want to do like, you can, you can spend a few days just focusing on the customers. You can spend a few days just focusing on your thing or you can do it any way you want. Uh, you get to design your day. And I think that's the flexibility that I love about my work is uh, I, I get to sort of design that every day or on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis. Uh, and of course, you you talk to different people around you, and you also get collaboration opportunities. So that's even better. Like that's the best part that I get to work at Nvidia, is you get to talk to anyone you want and about anything you want, and then after that, get to work with them. They get to contribute uh, to the project, and then you get to tell the rest of the world about it. Isn't that cool? Like, wouldn't that something that kind of flexibility you want with your work? So that that's something that is at least has been appealing to me so far. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know why I asked this question was like I think some ways, some point of time, I feel that some of my decision is controlled by internet today, because somebody okay. sends a mail to me and my day mm -hmm. just goes off like mailing him back to back, or it's like thinking about like what is his requirement today, like what should I deliver next, and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, somewhere down the line, consumer internet. That's your portfolio in NVIDIA to your daily work also revolves around that technology because mm -hmm. what's the role of consumer internet in world today? That's where I asked you this question of what does your day in a life look like? Because consumer internet is something which is very, very intuitive in terms of an development process because one of my guests told me that, you know, I just see an ad and I feel it so tempting that I really want to buy it off. Like let it be food, let it be an Amazon Prime uh, yeah. suggestion which comes in. Like, what's the role of consumer internet today for the world? Like, how good is it and how bad is it? And how people need to handle it with real care? Because people are not handling it with real care. There are a lot of chances that hackers can exploit you at one given point of time. There are ways in which, like thefts have been happening just because you posted your photo that you are in Maldives. There are a lot of use cases which have gone really wild and they have really told internet is not the solution. Like how responsible are we supposed to be in order to fit inside this market of consumer internet? Everything about consumer internet, I want it from you. Okay. So consumer internet is anything like you pick up your phone and you look at an app 
the fact that it exists and the fact that you're using it, you're probably not an enterprise, uh, an average user isn't, uh, right? And and so all the apps are consumer focused. Any Anything that is a B2C is consume, uh, facing the consumer. Consumer internet is any application that runs on the internet. Of course, there are many B2C businesses out there, but some of them run on internet and that's where consumer internet comes in. So that's how the term comes in. Now, what, the question about responsibility and use cases, let, let's come to that in a while. Uh, and let's talk about what is the role that NVIDIA is playing or I play in that, uh, in that whole ecosystem right now. So NVIDIA's footprint is pretty big, right? Like you said, there are many, many different, uh, you can say domains where we contribute to, there can be healthcare domain, there can be autonomous vehicles, robot, robots. Uh, NVIDIA has a big, big footprint, right? So we work in the healthcare domain, autonomous vehicles, media and entertainment, even, uh, you know, telecom industry, like Verizon Wireless, uh, many different research domains as well alongside that. But mostly let, let's talk about these four or five domains, right? Uh, those are, there are solutions architects specialized in that uh, area who come on board and then who help those customers, right? Now I work with consumer internet. I already told you what, what consumer internet is. Uh, let's say like pretty popular social media companies is can be a good example or streaming companies, right? Those are NVIDIA's partners who want to optimize their workflows on GPUs. So we already talked about how they want to do training and inference, or even since we're a graphic company, run graphics or run transcoding kind of workloads, right? So those kind of things, they come to us, we help them optimize, uh, optimize those pipelines. We look at their ML ops, we uh, like look at their frameworks in general and, and see where things are going wrong. Where there are various tools out there for profiling. We use them to figure out where things are going wrong. Now. Talking about how, uh, like from a user perspective of these applications, like I am also a user of, I'm also a consumer of these uh, applications, right? It really, uh, there are like options that these companies have provided you based on your privacy options. You can choose to, you can't avoid ads. Let's, let's make that clear, right? Because that's how these platforms make their money, right? This is the part where you are paying for that service in a way, right? Because that's how their whole revenue stream works. But what you can do is you could say, hey, don't use my data to recommend ad to me. You recommend ad to me whatever you, the way you want, but don't use my data. And there are ways to do that. And I've certainly turned them on. But that's, again, it's a user's perspective. How aware are you in, in, in terms of the service that you're using? If you don't want to see that ad, there was there is a way to hide it, and you should probably go do that. But that's how, like, you have to be also aware about how these things work, as opposed to just like signing up on it just because it's cool. And and um, so there is that responsibility that comes in as an aware user. And I think a lot of people are, in the world are already aware of that and already making use of these things, especially with the conversation happening around privacy for the past few years, right? And it's it's important. It's an important conversation to have, and it again depends from person to person how willing they are to uh, go down this path and actually uh, get rid of the ads or whatever that is it that is annoying them. Right? It's it, it's basically as simple as that. So it does boil down to the user at some point. I yeah, that that's how I see the situation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because uh, when I started in 2017, that's the, that's the year when I joined bachelor's. That's the year when you passed out of oh. your engineering. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, that's where, that's where ML fairness and uh, misinformation, disinformation, a lot of things were in a hype. It was just in mm -hmm. hype. It was not in hope. But today, when we see new papers coming up, it really has to talk about privacy now. Because medical imaging data sets can't be just thrown out to the world just like that. You need to make mm -hmm. it more secure. Federated learning. There are new approaches which are coming up these days saying that we are more secure today, so don't worry about it. But somehow hackers have exploited these technology also and they have somehow got inside the technology. But I, I want to ask you this one question. Will this be the reason for the new war tomorrow? 
like internet be the new reason for the war like it can be of anything deep fakes today has really changed the world like it's also used in a security aspect gans are still being used in security aspect in different companies like how much can be the threat that when it caused by the scale in which the internet is being used today because i think i it was a prediction that 2021 will have 5 tera 5 zettabytes of data terabytes is like it's in my hard disk so i don't have to worry about it <laughs> 5 zettabytes of data will be collected when i when i was in 2017 2018 mid i got the statistics that there is 15 zettabytes of data that is that the world is producing not storing producing i was like oh my god predictions are going like where is the prediction that they had and what is happening today like what do you mm-hmm. feel about it being the reason to the war tomorrow i think war is a pretty strong word for to for starters there might be some conflict yes at the same time you know internet is not the only threat in this world like there are plenty more and there are many many ways many many vulnerabilities there as well so internet is just one of them there are nuclear threats there are like bombs and from every aspect like you th- if you think about it there are many many people out there who might want to harm each other or for any kind of difference in ideology or this and that and there is there are ways to stop them just like when nuclear first came about like like nuclear energy that is the great use case where the nuclear energy was used for something good you produce energy you power cities for like lifetime right it again depends on what kind of standards and responsibilities do government set around it what kind of protocols exist around it we are still having that conversation and i think a lot of governments have already started regulating the use of uh, like you've heard of gdpr right a lot of governments have already started thinking about how do we protect our citizens or even the world as a whole from anything bad uh, that is a result uh, that results from this particular kind of innovation and i think we have seen this movie before it's not something that is new now as far as the question of will it be it I don't think I have, I'm, I'm qualified enough to say that will it be something like that or not. It's, again, there are standards that you can set around data. There are standards of anonymization. There are also standards of publishing data, uh, right? From a legal standpoint, yes, you can protect it. But then if someone out there, like a hacker, is set to figure out certain things, they might as well get to it. But then the question is, you like that person if they are like it's a life mission to do something they will probably do it okay and there is no fail safe to stop that but at the same time what you can work on as a society is to uh, figure that out and encourage like you know good behavior as opposed to that kind of behavior and why why would you want to even arise into conflict in the first place why can't we all live in harmony even if yes there are many variables yes a lot of people's lives are involved and yes there are uh, so many differences in ideology but then isn't that the point where you start to evolve right isn't that the good thing that everyone has different ideas and then you can evolve together with like great ideas i i whenever like it it always starts from even if you look at uh, riots and things like that, right? It always starts from like a small misunderstanding and perspectives, really. Once you're able to communicate that properly, once you're able to uh, think around it responsibly, I think there are solutions uh, to problems and there are definitely, uh, this conversation is important. This conversation has to happen. It, it is still happening at, at as we speak, but for it to mature, it will take some time. And once it's matured, I think we'll be in a much more secure world. And I, I still believe we are in a much more secure world today. So yeah, the very fact that we are even having these conversations is like amazing. Think about hundred years ago, we were not even having these conversations and the kind of conflict that I those, right? So again, there are, there are very great minds at work to help 
uh, support and I can I can send you some things that I've seen in terms of ethical AI or fairness in AI uh, and what kind of protocols people are thinking about. There are ways to contribute to that thought process today because as I said, the conversation is evolving, right? So you can reach out to these folks and submit whatever feedback you have in terms of ethical AI. Um, and I think that will be very useful for the audience as well to, to talk about it and have a role of, as a participant in it. Um, yeah, that's where the responsibility for, it's like for all of us right now, it, you have to go and talk about it. You have to contribute to it. If you don't do that, 10 years later, some policies get implemented and you get harmed. So the, the, there is a balance out there, right? When these policies are evolving, you nearly need to step in and actually do the work of a good citizen um, for the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true because we are building a good technology, but we are forgetting to build good engineers, a good person, a good human being because Probably it's not because of the education system, but the way we are approaching problem statements is also decreasing in terms of standards. Like South Africa doesn't have cybersecurity. It recently came out with some rules now. So, you know, that's where, that's where things are. Like, of course, we have seen a lot of ways in which threats have been uh, analyzed and things like that. But like approaches really matter. Like, I really wanted to ask you this question. Of course, this is not in a question bank that we really framed off. But I'll like, go for it. Yeah. What's your approach when you're solving a new problem statement? Like, let it be anything. Like, for your purpose, for the company's purpose. I, of course, you can't say the actual approaches which the company gives, but like, I can surely ask what's your approach. I think, well, Again, it depends on the problem. Uh, what am I trying to do here? Am I trying to solve or innovate a new machine learning algorithm? Or, well, actually that's a very wrong way to think about it. Am I trying to solve a problem that, and I need to research uh, about it, up, up, approaches? Like let's say the music and AI, right? Let's say I'm trying to uh, figure out new use cases, or let's say I already have a use case. The use case, let's talk about, um, how do I create an AI or something that listens to my input and then generate some kind of output in response to that input? So jamming sessions, right? How do I do that? Now, if I were to start here from, from the knowledge that I have today, I would actually go down to like archive or look at people who've already done this. Because if you, uh, there is a huge amount of possibility here. If you are thinking about something, there are chances that some part of that problem is already solved or some part of that problem has already been talked about. There is some kind of paper out there who talks about it or th this is not a new idea. Music has been around for a long time. AI has been around for a long time. Who hasn't thought of combining them together? So there, there, there are those, those particular aspects that I always like stand on the giants of the, you know, stand on the shoulders of the giants. Yeah, that's the right, that's the right keyword there. So yeah, I would go down, I would look at the research, and I will probably find out uh, who, who is talking about it, who is active in this field and shoot them an email or try to reach out to them and, and you know, talk to them for, for some time and, and figure out, okay, how, how are they doing what they're doing? What is the sort of motivation behind it? How are they solving the problem? And what kind of challenges do they see today in their own research? And then think about my skill set or the team that I have around me, their skill set. And, and think about how we can solve that. Because again, you have to always do your homework, right? So the first part is to figure out who has done that. Do your literature review, just like a PhD student and just like any kind of research project, do your literature review first. And once you've done that, uh, contact these people, whoever has written about it, whoever has a group working on it, they, all, they will always have next set of challenges that they are trying to work on. And since it's like OLOP, all of it is open research, they will always welcome contributions from independent contributors. And that's where like the magic comes in, right? You have your own resources that you can invest towards that problem and you can you, uh, you know, collaborate with them and help them also utilize your resources, but at the same time, help yourself by understanding what the problem is and what the next set of challenges are to actually make that a reality. Um, 
yeah that that will be my approach always try to figure out who is on this journey with you in that time and what kind of problems they are solving because there will always be someone and if there is no one then you have to think about okay this is a new problem let's just show it to the world that this is a problem there are papers who are like yes this is a problem we tried to solve it we couldn't solve it but you should acknowledge that this is a problem and that's where other people start thinking about it and then that they will contact you to uh, collaborate so uh, a research in any area even if it was a failure i would still encourage that you go ahead and publish even if it's just a blog go ahead and publish and tell the world about it there will be someone out there searching for those exact keywords and will stumble upon your blog and will contact you if they are motivated enough to do so and that's where like you know thing things will start happening uh so yeah that 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 would be my approach yeah you yeah, know last question because we talked a lot on compute but we didn't talk about the price points at which we will be seeing compute tomorrow like let's just talk of this mm-hmm. like what's the price point that you are going to see about the network and the compute tomorrow because both of them are extremely fluctuating because in the world bandwidth rate are uh, bandwidth rate is actually increasing but in india because of jio's intervention in the industry the bandwidth rate is such a cheapest now that i'm getting 750 gigs of internet for 1500 rupees like i still remember that for a gb i used to pay 150 rupees and it used to last me for a long time because it was still a 2g and we need not have to do such amount of fast internet fast phase in which the internet used to get used but today mm-hmm. i consume close to around 15 gb of internet a day that is that includes all the commits all learnings that i do like everything like what's the price point that you are seeing about the bandwidth and compute tomorrow i don't think i can answer too much about the network because i guess that is controlled by the isp the internet service provider that you have and based on the calculus they are doing or based on the projections they are doing uh, because on the industry certainly... also right exactly right uh, why would they want to give you that bandwidth at that price point and that is a calculus every enterprise has about their products why is coke the same can of coke costing different in india versus in us why 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 is that so that uh, thing is taken care of by lots and lots of phd's in the, in these companies and 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 it's important to have that conversation because as an enterprise they need to operate and they need they need to generate some profit right uh, in any given company you will find this uh, and 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 that's not just apply it doesn't just apply to bandwidth and internet uh, there are players beyond the isp also who would want to provide something to you at that price point so that you would be willing to pay for it there is a lot of social science and 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 like games involved in figuring that out and there are lots of algorithms involved in figuring that out now uh, beyond that for compute uh, i think that is again a conversation uh, that you know any gcp or aws person can tell you why is something priced at that rate uh, and and most of the time you wouldn't find it if you're outside that enterprise and even if i knew i wouldn't be able to talk about it right so uh that that that's a very uh, sort of under the you, once you come to the industry you will figure it out why why something costs as much as they do, they do but outside of that i can certainly understand your question um that there is always this curiosity and i think these are some things that are protected by uh, you know the N- ndas that you sign so this is uh i can guarantee you once you enter the industry it will be like super interesting about why things work the way they do and why things are made available to the consumers the way that they are uh and it, it it's fun it it's a really fun thing to understand to visualize uh but it yeah i used to be curious about that too and i'm still figuring it out as far as the nvidia since we are not an isp or or, or a cloud provider either today right uh it's still hidden away from me but you know maybe gradually uh, you will start to figure it out yeah thank you so much sir thank you so much for this amazing podcast it's 10:41 so 
so i think probably one hour 10 minutes more or some thing of this podcast might be but like i thoroughly mm-hmm. enjoyed every second that i sat with you talked with you and it was a new way for me to think of like hey there is something beyond research also in industry like i think this has clarified a lot of my doubts that i had i think to the listeners this is a futuristic topic that we have chosen it's not like it's going to be like for a 10 year old conversation or 20 year old conversation i think it's going to be there forever thank you so much sir thank you so much hey thank you for having me it was great talking to you we had a great list of questions i, I don't think i contributed them to that much but i hope uh, there were some cool data points that you got